Oasis Audio presents Harvest of Gold by Tessa Afshar. Read for you by Laurel Merlington. For my brother, thank you for your loyalty, generosity, and unwavering belief in me. 587 to 586 BC Judah is captured by Babylon and the temple is destroyed. 559 to 530 BC Cyrus the Great establishes the largest empire the world has ever known and founds the Achaemenid dynasty. In 538, Cyrus sets Israel free from its Babylonian captivity as foretold by Isaiah 44, 24 to 45, 5. He donates money from his own treasury toward the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. 530 to 522 B.C. Cambyses, Cyrus's eldest son, conquers Egypt. His reign is briefly followed by his younger brother, Bardia, who dies shortly thereafter under strange circumstances. 521 to 486 B.C. Darius the Great expands the Persian Empire so that at its height it encompasses approximately eight million miles of territory. Next to Cyrus, he is the most admired Achaemenid king. He is probably not the king referred to in the book of Daniel 6, 1 through 28, since Daniel would be quite old at this time. 486 to 465 BC. Xerxes takes over his father's great dynasty. He is best known for his notorious attack on Greece and for choosing a simple Jewish girl named Esther as his queen. The date of this event is not known. For details, See the Book of Esther. 465 to 424 B.C. Artaxerxes is known as a benevolent king who replaces several harsh laws with more humane rulings. He sends his cupbearer, Nehemiah, back to Jerusalem in 445 in order to rebuild its ruined walls. 334 B.C. Alexander the Great conquers Persia. Approximately 33 A.D., Jesus of Nazareth is crucified. Part 1. The Assault Chapter 1. The Twentieth Year of King Artaxerxes' Reign, 446 B.C. Winter, Persepolis Sarah's head snapped up as the door to her chamber burst open with uncharacteristic force. Her friend and handmaiden, Parry, rushed in, tunic askew, Strands of usually pristine brown hair hanging around her face in a haphazard tangle. The baby's here, she said, her voice high as she waved a long arm for emphasis. Sarah jumped to her feet. And Apama? How is she? Apama, the wife of the second assistant gardener, had gone into labor with her first baby three days ago. The baby had proven reluctant to come. By the end of the second day, everyone had started to fear the worst. Perry's lips flattened into a straight line. Bardia says she is too weak. They allowed me a glimpse of her before I came over. She's whiter than a bowl of yogurt and lies shaking in spite of the fire burning in the brazier next to her palate. A shiver ran through Sarah. Bardia, the head gardener and practically a member of Darius's family, was not in the habit of careless pronouncements. That doesn't sound encouraging. Perhaps we can do something to help. She strode to the bank of shelves built into a niche in one corner of her bedchamber. Neat piles of soft sheets, wool blankets, and cotton-filled quilts stacked on top of each other. Sarah chose an exquisite linen quilt made of various shades of blue and green fabric, embroidered with silver thread. This should help keep her warm. Perry's eyebrows climbed toward her hairline. Didn't the queen give you that coverlet? She has stunning taste, hasn't she? Indeed, my lady. More to the point, won't she mind your giving away the gift she chose for you with her own stunning taste? Not if she doesn't find out, Sarah said, unable to keep the smile from her voice. Besides, having suffered through a difficult birth herself, she is likely to approve. We should send a few things for the baby as well. Is it a boy or a girl? Perry slapped a hand over her mouth. In all the excitement I forgot to ask— I only know it is healthy. Sarah tucked a loose curl behind her ear. That's the important thing. I saw some linens in the storehouse that should suit a new baby, 
Let's fetch them. She and Perry paid a brief visit to the storehouse and retrieved a few appropriate articles for the newborn. His lordship has already sent over a lamb, Perry said as they walked back to Sarah's apartments. He had instructed Bardia to bring it over as soon as Apama gave birth. Sarah was not surprised by Darius's thoughtfulness. Children were highly cherished by the Persians. The whole household rejoiced at the birth of a baby, even one belonging to a lesser servant. She frowned at the thought of Darius. It had been five long days since he had sent for her. His lack of interest ate at her with a sharpness that robbed her of sleep at night and of rest during the day. Was he losing interest in her already? The thought made her want to weep. She had not always been desperate for his company. When her marriage had first been arranged by the queen, it had felt like a blight that ruined her life. She had chosen neither her husband nor the state of matrimony. Everyone assumed that a simple Jewish girl should be overjoyed at the prospect of marrying the king's cousin. But at the time, Sarah had wanted nothing more than to continue serving as the queen's senior scribe, the only woman in the empire to have ever been honored with such a post. The first four months of her marriage had been a nightmare of mutual resentment. But in time, she and Darius had learned to accept each other and settled into a happy companionship. She gave a wry twist of her mouth as she sat on a purple linen couch. Her feelings for Darius were far more complex than companionship. The problem was that she loved him. She loved him. Much good it did her, for he did not return her feelings. She knew he cared for her. He had set his concubines free and settled them in their own independent establishments and made Sarah the only woman in his life. By his own admission, he enjoyed her company and admired her, but he never confessed love for her. Her puppy, Anusha, tired of being ignored, interrupted her reverie by jumping up and putting his head on her lap, gazing at her with adoring eyes. At six months he was already large and beginning to develop the massive structure that had marked his cousin Caspian, Darius's favorite dog. Sarah still missed Caspian, who had been the most astounding dog she had ever met. She leaned over and caressed Anusha behind his ears, drawing comfort from the warmth of his solid body. He gave her a puppy smile full of pleasure. He had been a present from Darius. Her mouth softened as she remembered the night she had named him. Her first suggestion that they call him Silk, because he was so soft, had met with undisguised disapproval. Silk, Darius had exclaimed, sounding offended. He's not a little girl's toy dog. He is from a noble bloodline, worthy of kings and princes. Sarah had smoothed the lines of her flowing skirt over her thigh. How about Honey? He is so sweet. That would be a perfect name. Darius's dark brows lowered with displeasure. You don't like Honey, either? She pretended to pout. You said I could name him anything I liked. Ah, I did say that. I beg your pardon. Honey. Honey it is. He spoke the name as if he was chewing on a mouthful of salted, sour cherries. Thank you, my lord. How perfect. I can imagine it vividly. Having a house full of your mighty friends, and you calling out in front of them, Here, honey. Fetch, honey. They will be delighted by such a spectacle. Wench. The grooves in his cheeks deepened. I'd be looking at you the whole time I said it. Here, honey. He said, patting his lap. She burst into laughter and threw herself into his arms. I have a better idea. What if we call him Anusha? She suggested the name, knowing that her husband would approve of the allusion to the king's elite royal guard, better known as the Immortals. Now that's a fitting name, he said. He shall be a warrior dog. She poked him in the side where she knew him to be ticklish. He shall be a companion dog, she said, reminding him of the original meaning of the Persian word. Sarah sighed. She could not understand her husband. Sometimes, it seemed to her, he battled his own heart, wanting her with half and rejecting her with the other. Then again, he had never gone five whole days without sending for her, not since they had committed to living as true husband and wife. 
A Palma and her husband will be thrilled with your gifts, my lady, Perry said, interrupting Sarah's thoughts. She lifted her arms, now piled with linens they had fetched from the storehouse sitting precariously on top of the queen's coverlet. Would you like to come with me as I deliver them? I think not. They always seem flustered when I visit, though I do my best to put them at ease. What they need is peace and quiet. You take those with my compliments, and I will pray for a puma. Perry wasn't absent for long. She returned, carrying a tray loaded with food. Shushan has sent you thick herb soup with wheat noodles and hot bread from the ovens, she said as she set the table. She read my mind, Sarah exclaimed as the fragrance of mint and fried onions filled her room. I've been craving one of her hearty soups all day. Sarah bent over the bowl and inhaled the complex aroma of herbs and spices with pleasure. Darius's one-eyed skinny cook could transform simple vegetables and meat into an unforgettable feast for the senses. Bardia says a palma shows improvement. She smiled when I covered her with your quilt. She is too weak to speak, but her eyes filled with tears when I told her the coverlet had once belonged to the queen. Her husband more than made up for her silence. He bid me to thank you and his lordship so many times that I had to escape while he was mid-sentence. He'll probably fall at your feet or something equally embarrassing when next he sees you. She lifted the tray on which she carried the food and turned as if to leave before coming to a sudden halt. I almost forgot. A messenger just arrived from Susa. He has a missive from Her Majesty for you. Damaspia, the Queen of Persia, was kind enough to consider Sarah a friend, a privilege that sometimes exacted a terrible price, as Sarah well knew. The queen had entered into the habit of riding Sarah, sharing the latest news since she and Darius had moved to his lavish estate near Persepolis six months ago, while the rest of the court resided in Susa for the winter months. 